Welcome to COVID and Climate Change Correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. Hey, Scott. Hello. How's it going? Pretty good. How was your dinner? Oh, it's really good. <laughs> Trying to freeze frame? <laughs> your thing's still free frame. Can you, can you see it? Why does it? Why is it doing that, I wonder? You got some kind of internet pra. What's your okay. bot rate? All right. So what I'll do, um, you know, while we still have time, let me restart the bloody thing. Oh, you know what's going on? I'm uploading your video. Cookery crock. <laughs> well, you better stop it for the sake of this recording. You can upload it any other time. Okay. Okay, hold on. And maybe restart your computer. Oh, Lord. Or you could keep doing that and you'll be like Max Headroom. You have some type of handicap. Yeah, well, I'm still on freeze frame there, Steve. So, <clears throat> um, yeah. You know what I'm going to do? What should I do? What should I, what should I do? Yeah. Well, I will. It still works okay. The, the main hassle is when you get freeze voice. Freeze frame is bearable. <coughs> freeze voice is not. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm excited because I have, uh, I have something interesting to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I want to share my screen with you guys. Yep. Now this is a this is a really relatively recent interview I saw you do, Steve, with Peter um, Schiff. This debt ceiling, oh U.S. God. debt ceiling. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I quite enjoyed the interview, but what I wanted to talk about is, you know, kind of the positions of these uh, two other colleagues, these guests on the show. Yeah. Um, I I couldn't quite. Uh, make out Peter Wolf. He's at the top. I Richard mean, to be Wolf, really yeah. honest with him, I just I, I I couldn't start to really you know kind of get any traction on what he was saying. Mm -hmm. He did. He does have a, a position that seems very nihilistic about debt levels and kind of like the old school idea of debt. Yeah. Um, Peter's uh, position uh, is is much more interesting, and. Um, I mean, he's very much against your uh, position. If you even look at the title, it says Peter Schiff debates two socialists on debt ceiling. And I was like, what? Why? What? What's with the title? Mm, mm, <laughs> like, mm. why is that even relevant? And why would you be considered a socialist? Like, I don't I, I didn't really get that. What's your thought on that? Oh, the Peter is a, a gold bug and um, uh, pretty much Austrian in his approach to economics. And that's. Uh, and he actually has an interesting history. His father refused to pay federal income tax as a sort of uh, libertarian stance and actually went to jail over it. So that was sort of Peter's background. He's very anti-tax and anti-government. Um, so, you know, in, in that sense, anyone's a socialist compared to Peter. Uh, but they made Peter the frame of reference in the whole thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's something for you to sink your, your teeth into, Scott, because, you know, the full-blown liber libertarian here, here, um, you know, um, you know. There's no such thing. They still need government resources. They depend on military, police, mail, roads. They pretend to be a big government, but what they really mean is they don't want any of the tax money going to the working class. They want to make them as miserable as possible, so that they're motivated to work as hard as possible. So it, the whole anti-government thing is a crock of crap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, if you have you look, you look at their their writings, you get uh, uh, the argument. You know, the only thing that should be um, publicly funded as police. That's about it. Um, so they're in favour of minimalist government. Uh, so they so they say. But uh, you know that, that all comes down to well, does a does a, does a free market system uh, work best? And that's their ideology. Uh, history of the nineteenth century challenges that. Um, but you know it's just that overall ideology pro you know, pro liberty, the sort of liberty hang up of Americans. 
Well, one added thing I wanted to bring up with uh, Peter is that um, you call him a gold bug, right? So I get this, right? I mean, he's got the advertisement of Euro Pacific Asset Management in there. And conceptually, let me kind of paint a a picture here. His world is very small uh, in, 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 in regards to, um, you know, clients and trying to, um, you know, a, um, allocate money and put it into markets. It's effectively what is his business does. So, it, you know, if he has any kind of expertise for, you know, for his firm, he's basically, you know, knowing how Wall Street works and equities and, you know, various different, uh, you, you know, instruments, uh, financial instruments, right? Mm-hmm. But on the other yeah. side, you have a, a an economist and an academic like yourself. You're much more broader picture about the fundamentals, and it doesn't even seem like he um, is like he just digs in so much that it, he he's not even open to a uh, like like a broader sort of uh, you know perspective. It's it, I I don't know that kind of um, that that boggles my mind. Oh, it's fairly standard. I mean, it's just that, you know, the libertarian philosophy is very strong in America and with his family credentials and his uh, uh, you know, argument that money should be gold or gold should be money rather um, and belief that there's going to be hyperinflation courtesy of government money printing, blah, 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 uh, then he's sort of in that, in that sense the bastion for the libertarian uh, uh, semi-economic, semi-politics uh, group in America, um, because he, he he predicted hyperinflation after two thousand eight. If, if I'm not uh, if I recall correctly, I'm pretty certain I do. And of course, what we got was deflation. So it, a lot of this stuff comes out of a uh, and a lack of understanding of how fiat money actually works. And their vision was that the uh, government rescues would cause a massive increase in the money supply. Now, frankly, the Federal Reserve thought the same thing. And you get members of the Federal Reserve and you read the minutes from the uh, 2008, 2010 period. There are, uh, they're more conservative neoclassical uh, elements. We're all worried about hyperinflation. Well, you know, mm-hmm. I, I think there's a proof in the pudding there that nothing like that occurred. And uh, But they've, they've stuck with their beliefs. And, and Peter's similar here. He's oh, my cat's about to join the conversation. Hang on. Um, <clears throat> he uh, also expected hyperinflation. And the, the fact that it didn't happen doesn't change their analysis. Yeah, no, I, I agree. Well, we can move on. I I had played with the idea of trying getting him on as a guest, but I just don't know where it can go. Like it is, it, it seems kind of uh, closed minded, right? Uh, I, you know, I have an ideological position. This is the way I feel. It's, and- it might be it might be worth doing it in the sense that, like you know, as, as a sort of representative of the Austrian way of thinking. Um, then he's somebody who could, I could contrast with. But you know, people like, a person like Peter Bocchi was probably better because you, could, you, you have ac- academic Austrians as well who have at least read the literature to a larger degree and uh, are more willing to consider the, the statistics and what actually happened uh, in, in things, events like the global financial crisis. I actually spoke with Peter Schiff way, way back in 2008, I think, uh, on an Australian uh, current affairs program with a guy called George Negus, who was one of Australia's top interviewers. And Peter, it was just on occasion, just sort of didn't know what, how the hell to interpret what I'd said because he sort of drives the world into the, uh, a capitalist, uh, libertarian, uh, Austrian-style economists and anti-capitalist Keynesians um, and, and expected me to come up with what, what he saw as Keynesian way of thinking which you know, really is a bastardised version of Samuelson, uh, is what he was aware of was called Keynesian. And he really didn't know how to handle my, my arguments at all. It was quite funny to watch him. Where would that come mm. from? What's that mean? Um, you know, um, Do you recall it, the thing, uh, quite, what, what kind of the line to questioning was? Oh, that's ages ago. It's, it's, that's 12 or 13 years ago. Um, I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can actually locate any. Well, how, well, how about maybe even more fruitful just to define these terms, like. What's the Samuelson misunderstanding of a of what's the what's this what's the Samuelson substitution for for Keynesian and what's the real definition of Keynesian? Oh, look, the, the Samuelson definition is that uh, there's an insufficient aggregate demand and the government should boost demand to bring about full employment. That's that's uh, part of it. But they 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 see the entire. Um, uh, I was actually typing Peter Schiff's name into a 
and do a Google search here. Uh, yeah, and I've actually found that debate, so I'll send it to you. Oh, wow. um, yeah, I mean, they um, the argument they had was that you can control everything with varying the interest rate and varying government spending. So they saw the interest rate as controlling the level of investment and government spending uh, making up when, when the level of investment and consumption wasn't sufficient to give you full employment. Uh, and it's it's a car it, it's a it's a carbon a sort of cardboard version of Keynes, um, but actually based right, so on what investment what increases is. Consu- investment increases consumption how? Oh, and if inv- investment it leads to you know increases the level of economic activity. You know what they call the multiplier, uh, uh, or the accelerator relation that you. So if it you increases have, production. Yeah, yeah, it increases production enables more for consumption and so on. It, it was all this idea of inter- intersecting curves. You had the idea of the aggregate supply, aggregate demand curve and aggregate supply, uh, although aggregate supply being a 45-degree you know, line. I'm doing this badly with my hands here. And then aggregate demand being uh, sort of a downward sloping line that you could move up by government spending and the government could boost to make up the difference. And then the argument that if you drop the interest rate, you uh, make um, investments more desirable because the only thing that varies willingness to invest is the interest rate because, of course, capitalists know the future. Um, this is the economic theory I'm talking about. Uh, so they have a set a whole set of investments with a net present value dependent upon the interest rate. And if you drop the interest rate, then more investments be, get taken on. And so you boost uh, private, private uh, investment and that boosts the economy. Well, I, I can see how that, that would produce, that would increase production, but why would it also increase consumption? I don't understand that. you got to hire workers. Oh, I see. So everyone has more money to spend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's... There's a trickle, that, 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 trickle down, right? Sort of. I mean, this, this, if you, that's, a, that's a major topic in some ways. How did Keynes get uh, bastardized into um, just using those two tools to, to manipulate the economy? And uh, it actually goes back to... The, if, you look, if you look at if when Keynes' general theory came out, this was in 1936, okay? Not, not at the beginning of the Depression, in other words, virtually towards the end. And the, if you look at the historical sequence of the Great Depression, first of all, mainstream economists thought nothing like was, that was going to happen. The boom of the 20s was going to continue. Same sort of attitude they had about 2008. Okay? So you've got an expectation of a continuous boom, and suddenly in America... Unemployment goes from zero to literally 25% of the population. Okay. That, was a, that was between 19, 19, the recorded percentage rate of un- unemployment was zero in 1929. By 1932, it was 25%. Did, did that and include structural unemployment, which is that 5%? That was just, that, that, back in those days, un- unemployment wasn't collected, like, you know, there weren't statistics to distort the numbers. The number of people registered as unemployed at doll offices unemployment officers because the dollar didn't really exist or registered as unemployed at their trade unions because the main people keeping records of unemployment back then were actually trade unions. So it was. So it, there's no arguing about it. 25% of the population was out of a job and looking for work. And the conventional economic theory was, well, that'll cause wages to fall, okay, uh, because the whole hassle was that wages are too high. So if wages fall, that'll mean workers are cheaper and so capitalists to hire them. So all you've got to have is have wages fall enough to uh, stimulate employers to hire the workers and, hey, prestio, the unemployment will disappear. The wages did fall and nothing happened because the, the thinking leaves out the role of, of wages as one of the major sources of aggregate demand uh, and also, of course, completely ignored the level of private debt. So all this analysis was devoid of any perception of the level of private debt when, again, the whole 1920s was a private debt bubble. And most of that private debt bubble went into margin debt. This is the other bizarre thing about the 1930s. Level of margin debt uh, at the end of 1929 was 13% of GDP. Now... Well, was, going back just one second. So, so there was yeah. an increase in workers wanted signs, but the, but the workers weren't motivated to take those jobs because the wages were too low to, to motivate no, them? No, 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 no. The argument, the mainstream argument was that if there's... And if there's anything like a huge gap between demand and supply in a given market, and they included this for the labour market, then the problem is the price is too high. The suppliers want too high a price. Okay? And they, they, what you, you, you think demand and supply thinking, you know, draw two intersecting lines, and your horizontal is the number of people uh, 
uh, the population um, that's employed and the vertical line is the wage. And the argument was, well, what we've now got is a huge gap. The number of people who are supplying their labour uh, at the going wage is way, way above the number of uh, people who workers, who employers wish to hire at that going wage. So the argument was if you drop the wage, you'll bring the market back into equilibrium and unemployment will fall and employment will rise and you'll come out, you'll recover. And like in Australia, for example, I, I think there was in the 1930s, the, the government here swallowed that argument and they cut wages by 10%. Now, that made the slump deeper because yeah. when you look at it from all this stuff that neoclassicals do is sort of microeconomics applied to the macro economy. Yeah? So if, the, if there's too many apples being supplied to the market, that's because the price of apples is too high. You've got sort of you know, price controls making the prices too high. Uh, so the solution is drop the price control and then you'll get back to the point where demand and supply are equal. That's the sort of thinking they've got. And, and that, that is something which, apply, which you sort of can apply to a small market which yeah. doesn't have ramifications for the entire economy. Do you apply it to, to labour when demand from workers is 70% of the economy? Then you have, is when you try to cut their wages, you also cut their demand. And that means you may actually end up in a worse situation. And Keynes spoke about this in the general theory. Right. Um, so he was critical of the whole idea you could solve the whole thing by cutting wages. That's what the mainstream thought. Now, what you then had was, uh, particularly under Roosevelt you, well, in America, you had the so-called New Deal, and that was an enormous increase in government spending. Government spending was still quite trivial compared to what we're used to today. So before the Great Depression, um, you know, back in the 1920s, government spending was about 5% of GDP or less. Now it's 30% or more. Okay, So a gigantic change across the Great Depression and the Second World War. And... Um, at the, so at the, at the time of the end of the 1920s, you had this trivial level of government spending. And then Roosevelt said, well, it's, you know, we just haven't got the demand for the, for the workers. So he ran the New Deal, hire workers to build the Tennessee irrigation and power scheme, the Hoover Dam. Uh, uh, all, I think that was when the highways started being built across America and so on. They were all government spending. And that boosted demand and reduced unemployment. And then you had a period where there was unemployment fell from 25% to about, I think, about 11% of the population. And at, at that time, the mainstream thought they said, oh, the crisis is over, um, you know, we're getting back towards equilibrium, this will keep on happening. So Roosevelt started being influenced by his advisors to, re to repair the, the, the budget, get the budget back into balance again. So he cut the deficit from about 5% of GDP, 3 to, 3 to 5%, towards zero, and unemployment rose from 11% to 20%. This is in 36. So at that point, you can pretty much see what the, what the mainstream is here, the neoclassicals. We don't know what the fuck's going on, you know. Please, somebody else tell us what's happening. And the general theory arrives. And so that, that, and that, at that point, everyone recognized that government spending, which is just a way to avoid giving a universal basic income, you're providing kind of busy work, which might have good side effects, but you're providing some apparently work type way in order to get working class people enough money to buy the stuff that they're producing so they can complete the, 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 the cycle of the, of the commodity, right? So that's, that's a, it's, it, a yeah. permanent, it's a permanent change in capitalism. From now on, there has to be some larger percentage of government spending. Was that the, the consensus? That's, that, that was what became the so-called Keynesian consensus. But what actually happened to Keynes' real ideas? I mean, Keynes had a whole confusion of ideas from his neoclassical upbringing to the way he was breaking away from it. But it was nonetheless a you know, significant shift from thinking you could think in terms of microeconomics for everything. But the thing is, neoclassicals couldn't read his book. I mean, there's, there's a, and that, that's, that's not a, that hasn't stopped being the truth. There's a, a, Robert Lucas was one of the main conservatives who gave us the uh, uh, real business cycle stuff that dominates modern model building with you know, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models and stuff like that. And in 2003, he gave a speech at the History of Political Economy Conference, um, which the year that he became president of the American Economic Association. And he said uh, he, he relied upon Hicks's summary of Keynes because without Hicks, he couldn't have made head or tail of that damned book. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happened was when the general theory came out, 
first, like the neoclassicals at the time is sort of, you know, we don't know what the fuck's going on. Here comes an explanation and we can't read it. We can't understand it. So Hicks wrote a summary called Mr. Keynes and the Classics. And what that purported to be was a summary of Keynes. Now you can find elements of what Keynes said uh, because, because the, the general theory is a bit of a, uh, it's, uh, it's a hodgepodge. It's a whole lot of different ideas about how the economy operates inside there. So you can pick bits, bits of the hodge you like and leave out bits of the podge you don't like, and that, which, which you can see what Hicks did. But what Hicks actually did was in 1935 he published a paper called Wages and Profits, the Dynamic Problem. I think it was called something like that. And in that he was trying to build a dynamic model of an economy. He failed. But in the exercise of doing it, what he was trying to work out was how can you do a model of a, a, a three-sector model of the economy with only two sectors? Is this Hicks you're talking about now? This is Hicks, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what he had was the idea that you, if you have equilibrium in the labour market and equilibrium in the goods, in the, in the money market, then, then you, oh, sorry, equilibrium in the goods market and equilibrium in the money market, then there must also be equilibrium in the labour market. So therefore, you could leave the labour market out of your analysis and just have a model with the goods market and the money market to explain the economy. Okay? And, and this was back in, and what he then produced was, was you know, an intersecting line diagram of Keynes called IS and LM. And that's what the mainstream could understand. Ah, that's, what, that's it. Uh, Keynes is actually investment savings, liquidity money. Okay? And that's going to be our model. So that's our Keynesian model, and we can manipulate that. And this is what, like in particular, Krugman, is still on about. He goes back to the Oslo model all the time. But in 81... I got a question. It, yeah, sorry. What is it about this uh, Christian Western world that seems to be uh, gravitated towards, uh, you know, things that make a cross? I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a very good point. I mean, like if you think of over in Asia, what's the symbol? It's yin and yang. Yeah. It's a dialectic. Yeah? Uh, yeah. Two, uh, black needs white, you know. Uh, the curves intersect with each other, so that the Asian uh, vision is an integrated and dynamic and complex, and the Western vision is crucifixion, yeah, on an angle, or, or, yeah, rebirth and renewal, that type of thing. Mm. So, um, I was going to ask you about your economic model. Does it um, does it uh, does it go to equilibrium? I never quite got that. No, uh, it, it I mean, can't because you're in a lot. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you can. I mean. It, if you, what, what, you see, if you look, if you go back to the history of how neoclassical economics originated, um, it was in response to Marx, battling to get away from Marx, turning the classical school of theory into a critique of capitalism. So at that stage, what was an under, like a, a uh, undergrowth minority view, which had a utility, uh, as utility maximization as the purpose of capitalism, um, that was uh, undergrowth. You know, low status stuff, whereas the objective theory of the classical school was the serious stuff. And then when the 70s hit, 1870s, um, because Marx had turned the classical stuff into a critique of capitalism, very, very rapidly, all those ideas were thrown out of universities fundamentally. It'd be intriguing to see history of how that actually happened. Mm -hmm. And the people who believed that utility maximization described capitalism took over. Uh, but when they did, they said, well, we have to do static analysis. Where they try to build a whole lot of stuff from from physics, but that was a period of rapid growth in physics. Um, but they they said, well, we can use static analysis from physics to explain everything, and that's like ultimately you get Marshall's idea of you know intersecting supply and demand curves. So demand and supply together determine price and quantity, and you can't do one without the other. That sort of thinking. But all of them recognise that. Dynamics was the important thing to do, but they simply didn't have the technology for doing dynamics. But then in the 20th century, equilibrium became like a, a qualitative statement about the nature of capitalism. But in the meantime, the physicists and engineers had built techniques that let you handle non-equilibrium dynamics. So economists got locked into this strand from the 19th, 19th century, uh, leaving out dynamics and when they did start doing what they called dynamics as a bastardized version, no decent mathematician should respect. Um, whereas the non-equilibrium stuff came through complex systems theory and so on, and that's the foundation of my uh, modeling in, in, in Minsky and of Minsky. Is this, yeah. is this related to the, the problem of, of partial derivatives? 
it's actually ordinary derivatives. Okay, um, I mean because uh, like if you if you want to do if you want to do full scale dynamic analysis, then you need to take account, account of both space and time. But if you if you if you try to do if you, have you done what's what's your mathematics, Scott? Have you done uh, partial derivatives and stuff like that or not? Oh God, you know, no, no, I haven't. So I've just done calculus. I just I did, I did baby calculus at university, and then I took a chaos math course, which is just that, that logarithmic function, which is just re and I used Mathematica to model it. And my project was great. It was the one they put on the internet for the for the class. And I and I did a quantum mechanics class, and that was just matrix algebra. So I don't know jack about partial derivatives or partial, but I know that people were complaining about it and saying that these there's a certain category of equations that can't be solved because it involves partial derivatives, and, and so it was just a phrase that I thought is this related to what I mean. Anytime someone <laughs> talk, talks about a problem based on technology, I thought, oh, there must be a partial or partial integrals or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, so if babble you, from someone who has no idea what he's talking about. I shouldn't even mention. <laughs> it. You've got you've got half of it handled there pretty well. I mean, like differential equations. Uh, uh, are easier to simulate, um, but you have like a, you start with a set of initial conditions. But when a, a, an ordinary differential equation has just one fundamental variable changing, which is time. So you had the rate of change of, of wages with respect to time, and the rate of change of employment with respect to time, and so on. But so the addition have, of other variables that makes into a headache. Yeah, well, the more variables, the, the harder it is to handle. But uh, and like like past three variables, you can't you can't get an analytic solution anymore. So um, there are there are serious limitations on what you can do with ordinary differential equations. Um, but partial, it's even worse because you start what they call boundary conditions, which involve both space and time. And to actually be able to solve it, you've got to impose you know beginning and ending constraints on time and space. And the, the number of things you can actually solve is quite quite trivial. Um, and the mathematics uh, gets to be extremely complicated. And it's with, with, with economics, the approach that I've taken and that m most people working in dynamics have taken is treat just time. And when you, if you want to talk about different um, locations, then you have an economy in time called America, an economy in time called Europe, and they've got trade relations between the two. But if you want to do it partial derivatives, you want to say, well, here's, here's, the, here's the rate of change of wages with respect to time and space, okay? Then you'd have a different wager flying in Milwaukee to what you have in, uh, in you know, Dallas, that sort of thing. And, and it'd be in, the mathematics would just be beyond any possibility of handling properly. Uh, it, it, partial differential equations tend to be the sort of thing you have to have a conservation rule that makes it possible to set those boundary conditions properly. So if you look at all the work, all the uh, weather maps you see, they're partial, they're definitely partial differential equations because weather occurs both in space and time. And you have to have how one weather cell affects another weather cell. But what you can do is you can then divide the uh, atmosphere into grids, you know, cubic, Cube, you know, cubes of air, and your boundary condition is that the air passing out of one is the same as the air passing into another. And therefore, you can build enormously elaborate uh, simulation models. And have you guys seen the website windy.com, by the way? No, but we should check it out. Oh, mate, it's incredible. I mean, that's, that's, that's the most detailed mapping of the weather of the planet. I'm, I subscribe to it just because it's such fabulous software. Uh, but if you want to see what's happening with, you know, um, tracking hurricanes and so on, then that's windy in the background. It's running a whole set of different models or sampling a whole lot of different models, all of which are basically partial differential equation models of the uh, atmosphere where your fundamental dimensions are time and space, but also things like uh, a concentration of, of, uh, of trace chemicals. Uh, so so like I, have a teachable, that, I have a teachable yeah. moment here because I think um, I'm trailing the three of you. If, if Steve's leading the conversation, Scott's doing pretty good um, right behind. But my understanding of integrals and calculus mm. is is uh, it, it's a it's a, it's the study of approaching infinity. And so um, very quickly, you you can um, bring in the two variables, which is space and time. Do derivatives have um, are they typically usually uh, things other than space and time? They're really just in, in, 
Well, it, it, can, it can be things like, you know, chemical concentrations as well, rate oh, of change. Okay. okay. You, uh, but the, even then, the chemical concentration, the cells fall back to space and time. So the fundamental things in a, in a system of partial differential equations, space and time are your two fundamental dimensions. Um, but, but, but related to this windy thing you're talking about, it was actually in an economics class when the, when the teacher was making fun of the idea of, so you have weather monitors every so many meters apart. But even if you had a little tiny miniature weather station floating in space so that almost every X, Y, Z on the planet Earth had a little mini weather station in it, there'd still be problems because, because you're still be rounding and, and I guess the passing of information from one part of the cube to the next part of the cube like you were just talking about. So well, even, gonna... even if we had weather stations every cubic centimeter, we still wouldn't be able to predict more than three days ahead or something like this. Well, that's what's called chaos theory and complexity. And that came out of uh, Lorenz's work uh, back in 1963, can you see the, the, the this is windy? Can you see the? Uh, yeah. Okay. So what you've got is all the you know, high high pressure areas and low pressure areas and so on, and the isobars iso bars joining areas of equal pressure, and the color differences uh, can be temperature, they can be wind speed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here's one mini cyclone developing. There's the one. Uh, uh, not certain what the one what that one is. Here's here's the weather event you had off uh, Seattle a couple of days ago. So an enormously complex vision of the planet, and you can actually run it and say what's going to happen over time going forward. But the, the very first realisation of the existence of, of chaos and complexity came out of trying to model the weather, which yeah, was the Sensitive work. dependence on initial conditions. Yeah, yeah. And that was found out by accident by a Lorenz, Edward Lorenz. So what he what he did was he was, he was a mathematical... Um, what do you call it a mathematical um, uh, meteorologist, and at the time when people were trying to do weather predictions, they'd do several things. They'd, they'd, for example, look at a sequence of weather and, and uh, weather events, so temperature and precipitation, and then say, "Oh, this pattern is like that pattern 25 years ago." So we expect the next day to be like the next day 25 years ago, uh, or they do linear work. So they have a you know, linear model trying to, and Lorenz's argument was, well, you can't do that because the most important elements of the weather are non-linear. It's not how you add variables together. It's how they multiply against each other. Like temperature affects uh, precipitation, that sort of thing. Um, so he took what are called the Navier-Stokes equations and they're, you know, one, one of the uh, great mathematical challenges is to produce analytic solutions to Navier-Stokes which is still an outstanding problem. Nobody's ever done it uh, at, the, at the full scale. And um, he said, well, I'll take Navier-Stokes and strip it down to its, its, its uh, essence. And what he got out of it was a set of ordinary differential equations with three variables and three parameters. And his, uh, what he was trying to show was that it's the nonlinearities that drive the weather. So he got had nonlinear terms in the, in the model, and that's what he expected to see. But when he simulated it, he was working with a computer that worked at six digits of accuracy in turn. Right, right, right. Yeah, it's the tiniest bit of rounding makes radical and, divergence later on in and, only a few iterations. Yeah, and printed it at four digits. So he got a strange pattern for the weather and gave it to his technician and said, feed these results back in again and see what happens. So the, the, the technician typed in the four digits that were showing up on the printout and the pattern was completely different. And the divergence happens exponentially. So, like, uh, you, yeah. you would need, if you wanted to increase your capacity to forecast into the future, you would have to increase the your accuracy of estimates of now by an order of magnitude. So each doubling of accuracy meant an increase of an order of magnitude in your accuracy of current measurements. And this meant you simply can't do it. So after about a week or two, there's no capacity to predict it, and it's all the nonlinear stuff that dominates the model. So that's that's where the whole area of complex systems came from. And what it means is, uh, when you when you're working in this stuff, you're working out of equilibrium, okay. and that's what the neoclassicals still haven't got their heads around. They think everything happens in equilibrium. I can even give you a little if you want to see a demo of, of Minsky. Yeah, I, I'd have to find a one-to-one -one correspondence between the terms and the weather in the chaos that we're talking about. And the economic terms that that they're that are the equivalent. Yeah, I, I... yeah. But like in that sense, like, like there's a long-winded answer, which is appropriate given the topic, to uh, whether you can 
um, uh, whether my models reach equilibrium or not? And the answer is they can, but the conditions are such that it's highly unlikely and you don't have to be in equilibrium to model it, whereas the, the neofascicles presume everything's in equilibrium. And, uh, you know, that's where they go crazy. Yeah. Hmm. It, it's it's where my head's at, Steve. With um, you know, ever since I started digging into uh, Nassim Taleb and all of his um, well, his his uh, uh, bell curve bashing, as I like to call it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it deserves to be bashed. Yeah, like so, neoclassical made a whole range of so-called simplifying assumptions that rule out the real world, and that's that's what makes them so useless uh, in that sense. You know. Leaving out what actually drives the real world. Well, is there uh, someone in the community mediating the relationship between economists and politicians that says, "By the way, economists, just for the sake of of cognition, prefer simplifying and falsifying models. Actual models are are, are too complicated and, and can't be simplified. So, who in the right minds would appeal to their prejudice for simplification over truth?" Yeah, but unfortunately, that's what they do. So, and it, 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 you know, it, it, they they. When, when you see this, let's see, I was trying to search for this and I couldn't find it. I have no bloody idea of why I couldn't locate it, but let's see, I found the file. And now, now that we have computers, there's, there's no reason to worry about complexity anymore, is there? Well, yeah, you, you, if, if, you can, if you can write a model down, then you can simulate it these days. That's, that's the difference with, uh, why am I not getting, I'm trying to do a search. Oh, I think I said Lozens, not Lorenz. Okay, pardon me. Um, yeah, pretty much these days, if you can if you can simulate if you, if you can write it down, you can simulate it, which simply wasn't possible for the for the neoclassical. So they chose to do um, equilibrium modeling uh, that, that back into the nineteenth century. But in the meantime, the twentieth century has come on, and now you can actually do this sort of modeling, and they're not doing it because they think it's either not possible or not desirable. So, like, like I'll show you I'll show you the Lorenz system. This is the Lorenz system in Minsky. And it's a very simple set of equations. The equations are down here. So I could be here saying the rate of change of x is a multiplied by y minus x. And this one down here, the rate of change of y is uh, b minus z multiplied by x minus y. And a, b, and c are the parameters and x, y, and z are the variables. Incredibly simple set of models. You simulate it, and this is the sort of behavior you get. The three dots there are the equilibrium positions. So I start the simulation right near the zero, zero, zero equilibrium. And then what you can see, you can see it blasts away from the equilibrium very rapidly. And then it starts to orbit one of the other two equilibria, but rather than converging on it, it's moving away from it. And then as the conversion increases, uh, it will in a short while be repelled out of the orbit of that equilibrium towards the other one, the green one. Uh, but then it'll be propelled back to the blue one, and this goes on indefinitely. So this was like an absolute laydown misere for Lorenz when he built the model up and properly understood it to say the the fundamental models of the weather have to be nonlinear. You have to take the interactions into account. You can't do linear models, and the equilibria are unstable. And this is about to happen. I think the circuit after this. Watch what happens. It's going to bump. Yeah, this right? is, this is like, yep. It's like cool. a strange attractor, right? It's called a strange attractor. Yeah, this is this this is the original strange attractor. And well, if you actually solve for the equilibria, what you find is that they're all unstable. So the red one, it's just gone past there. That's got uh, one negative value that attracts the um, system towards it, but two positive that push you away. That's called a saddle point equilibrium. Yeah. That's unstable. And then the other two have got one stable. Uh, what's called real eigenvalue. So that's got a negative value and that attracts the system towards it. But it has two complex ones and the complex ones give you the cycles. On the complex ones, the, the, there's the, what they call the imaginary part that gives you cyclical behavior, but the real part is, is positive. So as you're in your far, substantial distance away, you get repelled away from it. But when you get closer, uh, uh, sorry, when, you, when you're far distance away, you can get attracted towards it um, because the, the negative value of the attractor is much, much bigger than the positive value of the repeller. But as you orbit in, the, because you're close to the equilibrium, 
the repelling value of the, uh, um, the real part of the complex eigenvalue um, dominates and you get pushed away rather than pushed towards it. So you're attracted and repelled at the same time, a bit like a relationship, really. Mm, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, this may be a little bit of a, a silly question, but the butterfly effect is related to the, the uh, you know, the truism or whatever, the, the, the aphorism of the, of the butterfly effect, right? Uh, well, this butterfly. is where it came from. So like uh, Lorenz looking at his patents, patents when I said, it looks like a butterfly's wings. And then he talked about the butterfly effect. Like what I'm not showing in this one is divergence from initial conditions. I've just got one simulation running at one time. Uh, I've got other other versions where I'll have two simulations. I don't think I've got one of those. That's I just a, want to point out how, oh, how go, amazing yeah. of a, yeah. how exciting that would be to discover that. You you discover oh, yeah. it, you look at it, it takes that form, and then just by luck, the, the shape that it takes is actually mimicked in nature, as an example. Yeah. Yeah. It's like oh, it's, so this, it's just so beautiful. I think it's me. It, it's it's amazing. Yeah, I don't know that I've actually. Uh, this is also just a single simulation, unfortunately. So I haven't got I haven't got the uh, diversion of the initial conditions there. But yeah, it's it's absolutely gorgeous system. And like when I did when I when I did my model of Minsky, uh, which I'll just find. Hang on a sec. Uh, I got as not not as exciting, not as, not as sexy a, a pattern as that. But when I simulated my model, this is what I got as a surprising outcome. Uh, watch the watch the shape of the of the two. The, these are three phase plots. This is wages share of output versus employment, employment versus debt ratio, and and weight and wages versus the debt ratio. And what you get, it looks like it's converging, and then it starts to diverge. Oh. Okay. So that was quite exciting when I saw that, and what was you know in some ways this is a highly stylized model. I'll never see this turn up in the real world, and that's exactly what the great moderation was. And this period of diminishing cycles, which the neoclassicals thought was a sign of their, how well their policies were working, and then a breakdown they blamed on exogenous shocks. You know, um, whereas this sort of work you can integrate the two together, and your explanation of the boom is the same as the explanation of the slump. Did you have any? Uh, did you write a paper on this, or have anything to do with? Oh yeah, research? back in '95. Oh, wow, that's pretty. I impressive. wrote it in '92. Actually, it was, it was I, you know, I wrote it in '92, and it took three years until the journal published it. Wow, uh, that's, so, a, that's a good uh, discovery. Hmm. So that's the. Uh, let's go back and bring the voice faces up here. Yeah. So. Uh, the, We've, we've rambled all over the place here, but that's why nonlinearity is so important. But the nonlinearity that matters for economic analysis largely sticks to time rather than including time and space. Uh, so what you're basically pretending is that each economy is a point, you know, uh, and then if you want to have uh, looking at more than one economy, then you have two points, uh, which is, you know, it's a bastardization. It's, it's a massive simplification. But the difficulty of writing out a, a set of equations in terms of change over space as well as change over time is enormous. And then it's not so much the difference between, like how can you explain the difference in wages between Milwaukee and New York? Uh, well, it, it could still be a point, but it would have to be a point in like five or six dimensional space, right? Yeah, or, or you've got, you know, if, maybe five, if you wanted to do the whole of America um, with the ordinary differential equation approach just with time, then you'd make up five or 600 models or with the trade between each other. And then the trade would be like the third dimension, the time dimension. Oh, sorry, the space dimension. Oh, really? You would put it in a big network? And, uh, yeah. That, that's I mean, that, interesting. That's, How do you – so what's the logic on the trade gate? Well, I mean, this is something I haven't done yet, so I'm talking through my hat in that sense. But the basic idea would be that you have a, in, in national, national economies each with their own currency – each with their own productive capabilities, which can be very different. And they are then export and import, um, depending on their you know, industrial base and, and the diversity of products they produce. And that requires financial flows as well. 
So you've got a model involving physical flows and financial flows. And the, 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 the beauty of the, the um, space side of it all is you can apply a conservation law there. So uh, whatever is an export, the, the sum of all exports and imports is zero. Okay? So you can impose that sort of conservation law. So if one country is running a surplus, uh, then there must be collectively the other countries run an equivalent deficit, that sort of thing. So you get, you get some ways in which the, those those conservation rules enable you to um, handle that type of dichotomy. But the, the actual system you're looking at, each economy, is what's called a dissipative system, not a conservative system. So when you look in terms of chaos theory, there are two classes. There are what's called Hamiltonian and non-Hamiltonian uh, chaotic systems. And Hamiltonian ones are ones like Lorenz's, which are subject to a conservation law. Uh, whereas the non-Hamiltonian, uh, they're called dissipative systems, are things like biology, the interaction of uh, predator and prey, for example. Uh, you don't get any conservation. Like You don't have any rule that the mass of the predators and prey must always be constant. Okay? Mm. But when you're modelling a weather system, you do have the constraint that however you distribute the um, segments you've, you've broken the, uh, the atmosphere down into, the volume of the atmosphere doesn't change through a simulation. And that gives you a conservation law. It makes, makes the whole, um, I guess, field of complex systems, uh, I, 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 guess, uh, I guess, much more reliable. There's more work to be done. Uh, in the field because of this conservation baseline that, that carries through as a, as a standard, right? Well, I mean, it's, it, 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 like in, in, in areas like economics, um, you don't have a conservation rule overall. Like, it's like, you know, the GDP is not conserved. The workforce isn't conserved. Um, the amount of stuff we're taking out of the planet isn't conserved. Um, so with weather systems, that, that's a different category. You, you all of these systems, I mean, we, we lose, you know, bits of the atmosphere to outer space every year. We also have meteors coming back in. Um, so if you wanted to be, you know, totally tight about it, you say it's not a conservative system. But the, the changes in the volume of the atmosphere due to, you know, solar wind blowing off particles versus meteors dumping stuff on the Earth, it's so trivial compared to the volume of the atmosphere that that's ignored and you say the atmosphere is conserved. And then you have a rule that says, well, uh, once you've conserved it, then you break it in two bits, then any atmosphere that passes out of one bit must pass into the other and they make it four and, and so on and so forth. So you can break it down in a, in a fairly logical and sensible way. When you try to do that with economics, yes, you can do it at the level of international trade. So anything that's exported from one country must be imported into another. Okay? But within each of the economies, what you've got is something which can be growing or shrinking depending upon the amount of energy you, you know, you're, you're harnessing and the technology you're using and so on. So overall, it means people, what I use is, is ordinary differential equations uh, to model the economy rather than partial differential equations. Oh, interesting. Hmm. So you don't, need that base, you don't need that baseline. Um, you, 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 don't, you don't need it. Like you absolutely need it in meteorology. You couldn't do it without uh, partial differential equations. Uh, you know, again, that windy map I showed you, you know, what's moving from one cell is moving into another mm. in the overall model. Um, and, and, you know, the incredibly sophisticated models. I mean, the, the fact that they can predict the weather 10 days in advance fairly accurately now, um, despite the fact that now it's chaotic in nature, so the divergence is nonlinear, it, it's a work of art that that is done so accurately. And then I compare what economists put out. It's a load of shit. By comparison, they've got the high to say they've got these beautiful models. They're bloody trivial, and and based on you know totally distorted ideas of reality. Um, well, nothing but, like the sophistication that the meteorologists have. Yeah, but I, I have to admit though, Steve, that that that, that hiring campaign to do the shift in society might not be taken well. Let's uh, boot out the economists and put the meteorologists in there. People will say, "Wait a minute, they can't tell the way." You know, you know how people people are, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when I, when I, I took a, uh, it was a philosophy class, and we talked about how uh, Citibank had hired chaos mathematicians. Because in certain of these uh, uh, functions, like the logistic map, these reader mm -hmm. functions, where, where there are certain values of the uh, the coefficient that 
e even though there is variation in initial conditions, you, you get all alternation between, you get stable alternation between nodes. So it'll go from one to two to four, and then it hits chaos. But then after, after, after a certain value, it's like 3.8 something, then it, it kicks in, it, it's in a triple. And so they were looking, they were looking to find like, like values, like coefficient values that produce stability in systems that are actually chaotic. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a whole area, like there's, there's what's called the Feigenborn number. Like I'm, I'm dragging back my mathematics from 35 years ago, so I'm well and truly getting rusty on all this stuff. But there are a, a range of fundamental constants that come out of chaos theory. Uh, and you, you can get this transition from chaotic to non-chaotic behavior and back again in things like the logistic map. Um, so all, all this stuff uh, is sort of bread and butter these days for anybody studying mathematics. Uh, and it means that like the first thing you do when you build a model is you analyze its stability properties. Or well, you simulate it, as I, I can do in Minsky. Um, but the neoclassicals still think you can solve everything. And I'll give you a little example. This is he's dead, so it doesn't matter anymore. But a guy, a very nice bloke, a very conservative economist called Murray Kemp, uh, who was at my University of New South Wales with me. And Murray's a very decent human being, damn good tennis player, but a, a straight neoclassical trade theorist. And uh, there was a session. Uh, we we invited along a, a guy that I, I wrote a book with later called. Uh, Hein Schnabel, uh, who talked about chaos theory and complexity and the type of bifurcation maps and so on we're talking about here. And Murray in the seminar said, I'm sure, and I was there, so this is, this is firsthand, I'm sure I can prove a theorem that chaos theory doesn't change the uh, argument for benefits from trade. Okay? Now, he's a very capable mathematician. So he went off and he taught himself chaos theory and he then sent the paper to me to ask for my comments. I didn't have the heart to tell him that he'd used a Hamiltonian for it. Uh, in other words, he presumed conservation of matter in the economy. Uh, and I, I just, you know, you're working with the wrong version of chaos. You've chosen the stuff that doesn't suit economics. You've chosen conservative systems, not Hamiltonians, uh, not, uh, not no. dissipative systems. You're using Hamiltonian mathematics, not non-Hamiltonian mathematics. So economists are obsessed with the idea about equilibrium and optimality of, of a, a free trade, free market system. So in many ways, they don't want to know that the equilibrium is unstable. And then, like I've, I've read the textbooks that the neoclassicals use for their so-called advanced courses. The sergeant and another guy put out a whole bunch of texts on, on advanced macroeconomics in Python. And you take a look at it, and it's all fucking difference equations. It's not differential equations to begin with. Um, partial different equations, you can forget about it. They wouldn't even know what they are. And no stability analysis, no ideas, is the equilibrium stable? We just assume it is. You know, so, uh, yeah, ignorant lot. Well, you, you think there'd be an easy way. Why not have every year you would take the predictions and the models produced by all the economists in the world that year and just rank them by their accuracy? And then eventually people would discover, hey, People that consistently deploy, deploy these types of models, or, or like, mm -hmm. or, or, or chaotic type functions, nonlinear functions, it turns out mm -hmm. that they're more more accurate. Or their thesis may be that it's completely chaotic, and so it can't be predicted. But whatever it is, they're, they're making mm -hmm. some prediction. So can we just use uh, one of the evidence based criteria for distinguishing poor from good economic theories? If you had enough people producing it, maybe, and if you had people paying attention to it, maybe, but then, you, then you're saying the real role of economics is about prediction rather than ideology. And, you know, I wish that were true, but a large part of economics is to justify the existing system. So well, if you take a look at, like, the, the, the dominant models are dynamic, stochastic, general equilibrium models, neoclassical stuff, they completely failed to see the 2007 crisis coming, absolutely failed. They predicted 2008 it's going to be a great year, um, but they're still using them. Thirteen. Well, then years that later. category of, of equations should be tossed out and ridiculed, and and yeah. this should be public knowledge. It that's be, our it that's isn't. our job, Scott. We uh, yeah. we're, we've been given yeah. the task to popularize that, and uh, I, I I've been shaking my head for the you know six months or so that we've been doing this, going, <laughs> you know, but yeah, we you know we learn about this and we go, we 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 need to have like a. a a seminar. What we need, we need a, a simplifying kind of straw man or, or caricature or something in order to get this idea across. Because the saying is, doesn't catch people's imagination. People like images and, and simplification. 
So if there could be some catchy image or something that could that could put this idea out there, like like the meme masters on the internet, it it, it sounds trivial, but sometimes simplifying and and caricaturing things has a has a bigger impact oh, impact maybe. on policy and culture than you you would think. So if we could spin this in a catchy way that would catch on, then people would start ridiculing poor equilibrium linear modeling because they realize that it actually fails and failure is, is a kind is failure is failure. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had so much experience in the in the of the economics for the last half century, and it, it they always they, they simply think can't think of any other way to come to model the economy apart from equilibrium, and each each failure to predict leads to a change in the equilibrium model. But no concept of moving away from equilibrium itself. Like a guy called Olivia Blanchard, who's somebody, uh, he's, he's a, you know, he, was, he was a leading uh, neoclassical economist. I think he's been president of the Economic Association, American Economic Association, um, and he was the chief economist for the OECD uh, and the IMF, I think. And um, Olivia wrote a paper saying, "Do DSGE, dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, have a future?" And he, he and I were in correspondence, and he, he took my views in and actually noted my name as one of the names to comment on this first paper he had. And he said, what we should do, first of all, is state the things we all agree upon and then move on to the areas where there's disagreement or chance for development. He says, macroeconomics is about general equilibrium. And I thought... So his his very it, starting axiom. You cannot summarize me like that, okay? I'm one of your 10 names you're mentioning. No bloody way do I agree with that statement. But it's, there's so much imbued in thinking that way, they can't even imagine that you can model the economy without using right. equilibrium. It's a, it's a, it's a necessary uh, uh, assumption for doing any work. Yeah, and they don't know that it's not true. I mean, so they... Most of them aren't aware of complex systems modeling. They're certainly not aware of system dynamics. I mean, that's the, if you look at uh, my attacks on Nordhaus, Nordhaus is the one who drove system dynamics out of economics because that with limits to growth was a system dynamics model. And he did, rubbished and parodied and abused it. And economists were very happy to accept his trashing of it and continue with their equilibrium models. So we had a nonlinear dynamic model of the, of the economy and ecology called limits to growth which the authors of Limits to Growth, and you know, one of them is a friend now, uh, told me that uh, they thought economists would welcome the development of system dynamics as it would free them from having to think in equilibrium terms. They don't want to be free because, again, equilibrium has become an ideological construct of capitalism now. So they talk about Pareto optimality. You, know, you can't make anybody better off without making somebody worse off. That is an equilibrium situation. They have game theory, equilibrium analysis most of the time. Sometimes it's evolutionary, but it's normally equilibrium. Everything comes back to equilibrium. That's why I see that as the, the crux and the cancer of economics is equilibrium thinking. Very fascinating. Very fascinating. Well, um, on that note, I think we should wrap it up, but I wanted yeah. to point out to everybody that um, uh, Jürgen Randers has agreed to come on the um, on the show for November 30th. So Good. That'll be exciting to um, to talk to him. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Scott. And until next week. See you then. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.